It's the Emma Blackwell Show, searching the web for the most creative, intriguing, and captivating people in the world. Welcome once again to the Emmett Blackwell Show. Before we begin, I would like to thank you all for listening. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to this podcast. This episode is brought to you by BookBannersEtc.com and Willow Kester Jewelry. If you enjoy the show and would like to become a sponsor, you can by contacting me directly at emmett.blackwell at gmail.com. On this episode, I have New Mexico defense lawyer and author, the rattlesnake lawyer himself, Jonathan Miller. John has authored 11 books, and the majority of them are about the rattlesnake lawyer Dan Shepard. His most recent book, Rattlesnake and Son, dives into a father-son relationship that gets more and more complex with each page turn. John is a graduate of Albuquerque Academy, Comal University, the University of Colorado School of Law, and the American Film Institute. He also wrote for the syndicated TV show Arrest and Trial. We are very happy to have Jonathan Miller on the show. And John, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. Great to be on your show. Yeah, well, thank you very much. It's it's nice to have you. Now, you are traditionally a lawyer in New Mexico. How has being a lawyer inspired your writing? Well, uh, I started in New Mexico as a public defender in Roswell, oh. and I made a vow that I was going to get a novel out of it, and I did. Wow. Did you, did you have to like uh, defend any like alien species or anything like that? <laughs> I really did defend a guy who claimed to have been abducted by aliens, and he was, I guess, throwing rocks at a school oh. because he thought the aliens were coming back. And uh, again, we raised competency. The case was dismissed. Uh, but of course, I've always wondered, suppose he was telling the truth. Yeah. Well, you know, you never know. It's Roswell. <laughs> so <laughs> It's Roswell. All right. So now you've written 11 books and you've really made a path for yourself on Amazon.com. Have you received any awards for the things you've written? Well, my last novel, Luna Law, won the, uh, I've got to be very precise. I was a co-winner of the Tony Hillerman Award for Fiction in 2017, which uh, was a big honor. I shared the award with some really amazing people. And again, that was for Fiction, not like mystery fiction or legal mm-hmm. fiction or New Mexico fiction for fiction. And that was, uh, that's my biggest award and I'm the, the award I'm most proud of. Yeah. And really, it's such a huge, huge genre. I mean, that's, that's pretty impressive. It really is. Congratulations. Um, thank you. So now your books seem to take on the lives of multiple main characters, yet they have this undertow of law and legal proceedings. Um, my question is, who is the rattlesnake lawyer? I mean, is it one of the characters or is it the narrator or what's going on with the rattlesnake lawyer? On the way down to Roswell, and uh, there's a sign that says, watch for rattlesnakes. And I, as I was driving for down for my first job, I see this sign at this rest stop. It's about 38 miles north of Roswell on Route 285. And I said, this book is going to be called Rattlesnake Lawyer. And, uh, Dan, the character of Dan Shepard, who's in many of the books, is the rattlesnake lawyer. There's a character named Sam Marlowe, who is a rattlesnake lawyer. However, uh, I have become the real rattlesnake lawyer. Originally, it started as a joke because I was an East Coast guy and uh, going to a town like Roswell, I was a, a fish out of water. And eventually, I had to learn to adopt, learn to respect people from all walks of life. And instead of being a fish out of water, I became a rattlesnake in the desert. And, uh, you know, my card has the rattlesnake on it. Yeah, that's that's kind of creative. I like that. I like that a lot. So now the book Laws and Loves Part 1 actually shows the real side of the rattlesnake lawyer. Um, is this autobiographical? Tell us a little bit about this book. Well, that is a book about adopting, adapting to all the different worlds that I lived in. I also took two years off and I went to Hollywood and uh, got a master's in film and actually wrote on a TV series. Mm. And that, of course, did not work out. And I had to end up coming back to New Mexico and focusing on balancing three things, law, love, literature, and they don't always work together. So I wrote some funny stories about uh, the things that happened to me. Wow, that's that's incredible. I mean, really, and 
you know, when you write things out like that and, and you look at the, the life that you've led and that you're still leading right now, I mean, it really is a little peek into your life. It's cool. It really is. Uh, anybody who out there, who's out there listening, um, check out, um, uh, laws and loves part one, um, by Jonathan Miller. It, it definitely gives you an insight to what's going on behind the scenes of this amazing writer. So, um, now, how are you and the main character, Dan Shepard, alike, and how are you different? Well, we've got a similar background. Uh, I guess the the main difference is I like to say I am a much better lawyer than Dan. <laughs> and Dan will always seem to have uh, no more than five cases going on at once. Usually he only has one case going on at once, and I currently have about 200 active cases, Ooh. both private and uh, through the state. Man, that's incredible. Uh, I, yeah, and I, my, again, most of my stories are not as interesting as Dan's, but I, I do have my moments. And uh, he gets. There have been moments where I have written thing, written dialogue for the book, and then use them in real life. Oh. A lot of my voir dire, where I'm questioning juries, I do about a jury trial a month. Sometimes I have written it before, and then used it. And some of my closing arguments. Uh, I've written for books or at least written drafts of them for books and then actually use them in real life. So it's more like life imitating art as opposed to art imitating life. Yeah, but still, that, that's that got to be incredible. I mean, it's almost like being able to – I mean, because you're a lawyer, okay, your closing statement is one of the most important parts of the case um, that's being told. And and just be able to to process that in your brain, write it down, and then be able to use it in a case, in a real case. I mean, honestly, people must be kind of blown away by by the way that you speak this stuff out because you've had time to prepare it. Well, again, there's a. I actually put this in uh, in Luna Law, where in real life, uh, there's the the famous old saw that defense lawyers do is when you're crossing the street. Let's say you're at Main Street and First Street. And you're crossing the street, you look both ways, because even though you think the coast is clear, there's a reasonable doubt, something that causes you to look to the right, because you hesitate. And that hesitation is reasonable doubt. Mm. I wrote, you know, I've written that. And then ironically, uh, I did it in, uh, I said it in one of the books in Albuquerque, and I said on Lomas Boulevard and 4th Street. And in real life and in the book, I'm saying you're at Lomas Avenue and 4th Street. And unfortunately, I wasn't in Albuquerque when I was doing that uh, closing statement. I was in uh, Alamogordo. <laughs> well, still, I mean, it, it still kind of applies. It's really cool. I'm just wondering if anybody, um, you know, in the jury or anybody out there uh, sitting, you know, in the audience, I guess would be, I don't know, law, uh, <laughs> stand up and just start yeah. just clapping. I mean, because I can imagine, <laughs> I can just imagine a scenario like that. Oh, wow. Uh, I'm very dramatic. In the questions that I ask of people and uh, the, my closings and opening, and I, I try to take the drama and put it on the page. That's good. That's that's what most uh, excellent lawyers do. I mean, they really do. They have to, um, especially in, in defense, you know, they really have to build up this case to keep this person, you know, out of prison or out of jail or whatever the situation may be. Um, so, yeah, it, it really does play into that. So now we'll be right back yeah. after a message from our sponsors. We'll be talking to um, John about his books and, and a very particular book that we have right here. Um, we'll be right back after a message from our sponsors. Have you ever found yourself looking for a gift but just can't find something that's unique and different? There are many online shops to find jewelry, but most of those sites carry manufactured creations that are mass-produced. The internet is at your fingertips. You shouldn't have to travel through all the realms to get something amazing. At Willow Kestrel Jewelry, you will find handcrafted creations. Whether you are looking for a wire-wrapped pendant, natural shells, or beautiful precious gemstones, you will find it all at Willow Kestrel Jewelry Shop at Etsy.com. Willow Kestrel Jewelry uses genuine gemstones, including amethyst, moonstone, citrine, rose quartz, laramar, malachite, sapphire, and many more. You can make it rain with gemstones. I know I did. And it felt like I had been transported back in time to when me and my friend had to take a ring back to a mountainous volcano and toss it in to save the world. Now you can use the coupon code BLACKWELL20, that's Blackwell, with the number 20, to save 20% at checkout. Search Willow Kestrel Jewelry under Shops at Etsy.com today.
In a world full of obstacles and haphazard graphics, one company has broken the mold of building amazing book covers, banners, video trailers, and more. Book Banners Etc. is your premier source for the most epic designs. Constructed from the mind of independent author Lynn Lamb, Book Banners Etc. is dedicated to making your dream a reality. They offer an array of marketing materials at affordable prices. If you're looking for book covers that pop, banners that captivate, swag for signing, and alluring video trailers, stop by www.bookbannersetc.com. That's bookbannersetc.com. Imagine your world, then make it epic with www.bookbannersetc.com. All right, and we are back. Now, your characters are diverse. Other than Dan Shepard, what other characters do you have in these books? Well, there's a character named Sam Marlowe, who's the darker version of Dan. Uh, and in fact, uh, he's a lawyer who uh, I, I had one of my books, Rattlesnake Wedding, which was a finalist for uh, the New Mexico books, uh, I believe, in the mystery category. And uh, what I did in that one is I had a lawyer who literally goes insane. And I had Dan represent sort of the dark side of himself in a kidnapping case. Mm. And so uh, he's in one book. Uh, Luna Cruz, who's sort of a composite of all the incredible Latina lawyers I've seen all over New Mexico. She's been featured in every single book since the first one. And she's been the heroine of her own book, uh, Volcano Verdict, and also in Crater County. Uh, minor spoiler alert, she is a half-sister named Jen Song, who's half Korean. Mm. And I actually wrote a book featuring this uh, this Jen Song character, and so, that was uh, very exciting. So your characters, when they're in these books, they kind of tie into each book based on almost like Easter egg concepts, right? Where where it's like it might be somebody related to somebody else, and that's how this other story gets created. Is that how I'm getting it? Yeah, because Dan will uh, – the first book was about Dan. The second book was about Luna. The third book was about Luna and Jen. The fourth book, Dan meets Luna. Then eventually Dan will marry Luna and then divorce Luna and uh, back and forth. And Luna has a son with Dan who then is featured in this book. Wow, that's incredible because usually an author would, would take like a book and create a world around it with all the characters encompassed within one book and then they branch off later. You kind of do this revolutionary style of creating books around characters within this world. That's that's really incredible. I like it. Well, and the characters grow and also there are um, some of the characters that start out good eventually become bad and mm. then they become good again. Like literally the other character that grows older is I wrote one science fiction book called A Million Dead Lawyers, <laughs> which is set in the year 2112. And Marlo, who's comes basically comes back from, you know, a, let's just say a plot device. And uh, he is dealing with issues still resolved that had to be resolved 100 years earlier or need to be resolved from 100 years earlier. Wow, that's it really is unique. It really is. I like that whole concept. So now in the book, Rattlesnake and Son, Marley, Dan's son, is psychic, and it seems to add more problems to the whole plot. He's charged with a crime, and Dan represents him. How did you weave Marley's psychic abilities into this book, and what inspired it? Well, again, I was uh, listening to Stephen King's book, uh, Dr. Sleep, which is the sequel to The Shining. Mm. So I've always been fascinated with The Shining, and I've even seen the documentary about The Shining. And um, for you real Shining fans out there, uh, Mar Marley's Diary, the missing page is page 237, which is, of course, room 237 is the bad room in The Shining. Mm -hmm. So I was inspired by that. And literally, I do not have a son, oh. but I was getting these visions of what it would be like if I had psychic abilities, and they seem to be coming from somewhere. And the other issue I wanted to take is I moved to New Mexico when I was 14, and I moved to Albuquerque, and I literally felt like a fish out of water. Mm. And Albuquerque is now this incredibly sophisticated city, so Marley moving to Albuquerque wouldn't work anymore. So I had to move to the small town of Truth or Consequences. And I wanted to sort of intensify my own experiences 
where in real life I was sitting, I started writing my first novel when I was 14. It's mm -hmm. crap, but I still have it. <laughs> and again, taking that world of a 14 year old who's bullied at school, feeling lonely. And in my world, in real life, I was writing it, but just suppose he had activities, or excuse me, abilities and didn't really know it. And that's what I wanted to do with the book. Wow. And talking about truth or consequences, I mean, you have this story set in truth or consequences, New Mexico, and it's even kind of structured differently. How did you structure this novel? Well, again, I'm fascinated. There, there really is, I guess this is a national show. Um, originally, the town of Hot Springs won a contest on the show to name itself Truth or Consequences. Mm -hmm. So there's a town of Truth or Consequences, and I've been going through there for you know, 25 years, and I've been fascinated by this town and the name. Part one of the book, so, uh, is called Truth, and it's a fairly standard father and son story that you've seen before, where the dad is reconnecting with his long lost son, and the dad learns to love again, the son learns to be a man. I mean, you think you've seen this before, mm -hmm. and, uh, Again, it's implied that if they can just get it together, eventually they'll start their own law firm. And uh, I'm hoping to pitch that part as a TV series of the slightly psychic, nerdy son and his dad working together to solve mysteries and win cases. And mm. I think that's got that part is called truth. The next part about and truth is the truth section of the book is about half of the book, mm. about halfway through. Let's just say tragedy happens. And Dan is representing Marley in a fairly serious case involving a school incident. I don't want to say too much. Mm -hmm. That section, if the first section is called truth, the second section is called or. And uh, I wanted to get to the primal fears of a trial lawyer, of uh, what it's like to wake up and not be prepared to do a case. And that's every, they say actors worry about forgetting their lines. I'm sure radio hosts. Oh, yeah. worry, oh my gosh, I don't know what questions to ask. And that I wanted to go to that where the lawyer isn't prepared on his son's own case. He's agreed to everything. The whole state is against them. And, um, you know, there's some certain things I've done probably about a hundred trials that, I, you know, I have it a very straightforward trial. Mm -hmm. And then it just starts to get wild towards the end. And I really don't want to spoil it, but there's a neat little twist. Wow. The third part, of course, if we've got truth, the standard father-son story, or the weird trial scene, the third scene, of course, the third act, of course, is called Consequences. And Dan has to reconnect with his family, and it's got a uh, sort of a mystical end to it. Uh, I, without Again, without giving too much. Uh, I'm basing some of the structure on A Christmas Carol, where Dan has to put all the pieces together in his life. Just to go back to the structure, the first line of the book is, I can't hear you, who is this? And the last line is, we can hear you now. Wow, that's that's really incredible. I mean, just the structure of this thing. I mean, that's one thing that most authors don't think about. They don't think about the structure, They let alone think about the formatting. They are not thinking about those little things from the beginning to the end, the different acts. I mean, when you structure something like this in a way that, that really captures the entirety of the book, it really is incredible. I, I like this concept. It, it really is cool. So now your other books deal with other lawyers who take on their own trials. And we talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, when you start building a new character, um, do you look for real life scenarios to build your stories? Yeah, I'm a lawyer in New Mexico, and I travel all over the state. And there is uh, one of my, uh, the, the book Volcano Verdict, I had a boss who uh, was busted with $500,000 worth of marijuana at a Border Patrol station. Whoa. And then he died, and he left a suitcase with the cash with his legal secretary. And I just said, that's a book. <laughs> and uh, I could just imagine you walking I, around New Mexico, just people just doing crazy things. Well, that's a book. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that's a book. And uh, another, um, I had a dispute with a lawyer. Um, and while that dispute was going on, I wrote a book. I wrote Conflict Contract 
while I was go- going through the litigation with this other attorney, real vicious litigation. And I literally, just to keep the keep my sanity and keep my emotions in check, I wrote a book which had nothing to do with that. And then that lawyer uh, took his own life. And then I was ready to write about that uh, and just take it, uh, you know, deal with my own emotions about dealing with somebody who then took their own life. Wow. That's... And uh, there's a great line. I, I love this is one of my all time favorite line in a movie is Tony Montana in Scarface saying, I always tell the truth even when I lie. Oh yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, I honestly I when I first checked into your books and and I was looking into this and I'm like okay, he he's a lawyer, he's an attorney, okay. Um and I wasn't like really blown away by that and I didn't really think about all those things that happen in your life. You get you get stuff that's up front right in front of you. Most of the people get to hear it on the news later on. You're right in the heat of the moment, right in you know, the courtroom. So you're seeing everything, you're experiencing everything. You're even controlling some of the things that, that most people don't even get to control. You're you're able to provide information that nobody else would have. I mean, it really does um, lead a very incredible life. It's, it's really cool. You know, you're, you're defending a murder and in, in real life, this really happened. I was defending somebody accused of a very serious crime and his mom was cutting my hair and it wasn't a very good haircut. And the question is, how much do you tip? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's that's something, I, you know, and that that to me is the courtroom stuff. Anyone can write the courtroom stuff. I try to write the whole holistic world, how law affects people, how people affect the law. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's really incredible. And then being able to be so close to your clients and being able to, you know, experience their lives as well. That's that's got to be quite a bit of uh, intake. I mean, it really is. So now you've written quite a few books and you've got practically the perfect stage to gather information about things. What advice would you give an author who's just starting out? Again, uh, write from your heart, but edit from your head. Mm. There's a line that um, from a forgotten movie, which is just because it happened to you doesn't mean that it's interesting. And um, you have... Uh, Everybody has had interesting things that have happened to them in their life. Everyone has had funny things that have happened to them in their life. But you, your audience is not yourself. Your audience is other people. I I like to look at it is that you are in a car with somebody else and you're telling them a story. You've got to be polite to them. You can't be too loud, can't be too soft, but you've got to hold the other person's interests for the two hours of a journey. And if you're going off on your own tangents, they're not going to be interested in that. You've got to tell a story that is compelling. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Definitely. So now we've come to the part of the show where I actually put either the author or the guest through some type of quiz or some type of trial by fire. And we are now choosing uh, the 20 questions game. And because you're a lawyer, um, you're, you're familiar with asking questions. So I'm going to um, be, uh, let's just say a murderer who now has a murder weapon. You as a lawyer has to f- have to figure out what murder weapon I have by using 20 questions. So if you can get this in 20 questions, then you win. Get this 12 billion Points. Now, these points can't be used for anything. <laughs> they can't be exchanged for money, but you can say that you just got 12 billion points on the Emmett Blackwell show. So, <laughs> all right. Are you ready, sir? I am ready. All right. Let me pick the murder weapon. And I got it. Go ahead. Is it, uh, a, me- is it a mechanical device? No. Is it a knife? No. Is it something uh, that occurs in nature or is it manufactured? Is it something that occurs in nature? No. Is it manu, is it something from the present day? Yes. Ooh, this is tough. (laughs) Is it uh, a rope? No. And it's not a gun, it's not a knife. Is it a... um, is it something that's available without a license? Yes. Hmm. Is it something found all over America? Yes. 
Hmm. Can you buy it at a store? Yes. Could you buy it at a Walmart? Yes. But then again, you can get everything at Walmart. So. <laughs> yeah, I know. All right. Can you buy it at a uh, at a supermarket? No. Ooh. Can you buy it at a hardware store? Yes. Is it a saw? No, but close. Ooh, what is it? Is uh not a saw. A uh, hammer? No, getting colder. Uh, okay, a saw. It's not a knife. What is something that you use in a uh Is it a tool? It is a form of tool, yes. Oh gosh, now we're getting how many questions have I used? I don't remember. <laughs> Just keep going. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> is it a is it a hacksaw? It's not a it's close, so it's like a hacksaw. Very, or very bone close. Saw. A jigsaw? Yes it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, congratulations, you won. Uh, twelve billion points with the end of Black Poster. I didn't think you were gonna get that because Okay, I have a jigsaw on my uh, Amazon shopping list right now that I want to get um, because I want to do a whole bunch of home improvements this year. And uh, <laughs> I was like, yeah, jigsaw. And I was like, oh, there's no way that he's going to get this. And boom, you got it. <laughs> well, I, I was learned, you know, I mean, my education taught me how to ask questions. And then I guess in my writing has taught me how to answer them, if that's my profound statement for the day. <laughs> yes. Well, congratulations. You won the game. And it was incredible having you here on the show. Um, folks out there, check out Rattlesnake and Son. Get yourself started into this world of the Rattlesnake Lawyer. Um, and, uh, John, where can, where can people find you? Um, do you have a website? I have, my website is rattlesnakelaw.com. I am on Instagram. One of the things I'm, I'm starting to get serious about photography and we are hoping to do a illustrated ebook of Rattlesnake and Sun where pictures of all over New Mexico, all the places that I go. And, uh, I, I guess you're up there in Michigan. Mm -hmm. You have never seen a sunset like you've seen a sunset over the Elephant Butte Reservoir, uh, outside of Truth or Consequence. Man, that, that would so, be incredible. Uh, so I'm Instagram. I'm Rattlesnake Law on Instagram. All right, and thank you again for being here on the show. It was it was a lot of fun. Thank you. It was a pleasure. All right, and this is Emmett Blackwell signing out. Keep on reading and keep on writing, my friends. It's the Emmett Blackwell Show, searching the web for the most creative, intriguing, and captivating people in the world. <laughs>